settings and see if it was installed in the correct directories and things like that. So that the, the CI sped, sped things up a lot again and kept everyone on the same page, especially working you know in different time zones and things like that. So yeah, that's that's sort of the point there. It was in infrastructure. Um, so we moved um, from from uh, GitHub to to GitLab. Um, and that, that sort of harnessed the integrated CI features of GitLab. And also, the, the, the issue, there's an issue tracker built in to GitLab. So, so personally, I think that, that's good because if someone wants to come to the project and they're new, they don't have to find the, the bug tracker or the issue tracker and then find out where the CI is hosted. It's all in one place. And it might be a bit easier for them to get, to get going or review the issues and so, you know, try and see if they can find one that, that's related to them or they can try and patch or something like that. Um, so every merge request um, gets tested. So we have servers um, that are provided by CodeFink and works on ARM, uh, and they they build the um, the runtime across multiple different architectures. So we test for x86, ARMv7, Arc64, and I think 32-bit Intel as well is also is also there. Um, so yeah. So so if someone um, decides that they need to patch a certain lib in the in the SDK, they can do it locally, do the patch, push it up, and then our CI will test it, make sure that it's successful on all different architectures and they've not broken anything specific architecture. If that's cool and it passes, we then review it. If, if everyone's happy, it gets merged in. Um, so it's quite a transparent process, and you know everything's, everything's in the open. I just think it's a really nice workflow for, for new contributors. Um, yeah, so this is just a quick picture to show what it, what it actually looks like, uh, so you can sort of see there's our, our pipelines. Um, you can just see one at the bottom there where, it, where it's failed. <laughs> uh, the rest, we're all, we're all passing at the moment. Um, we've got yeah, 14 open merge requests, so they're all running as pipelines there and being tested. We have the issue tracker, and then people can review the files. And we also have a handy little wiki as well where we can put key, key points about the project, that were decisions we've made over the time of things to give people a bit of context to why we've done uh, X, Y, Z. Um, yeah, so I'm going to pass it over to Valentin here because this is one of the sort of the new features of the 1.8 runtime which Valentin worked on. So, yeah, see you, Valentin. So, um, one of the issues with uh, 1.6 was uh, multi arch uh, support. So, uh, of course, you can, uh, applications will come with, uh, you can choose their runtime. So, you can uh, easily run with Flatpak a 32 bit uh, application on a 64 bit machine, but there are some applications that need. Uh, uh, several uh, architectures, and one example is Steam, and then there will be coming a wine, pa wine packs that I don't remember who is working on that, but uh, it's uh, something to uh, package uh, Windows application, and it needs also two architecture to work for the application at the same time. Um, the way that was done in 1.6 is that um, we take the runtime for 32 bit, so uh, and we bind mount it into a subdirectory. And then after um, uh, we add the path to the libraries into the uh, LDSO cache or, or the LD library path, in the, depending on the case. Uh, but there are issues that we have uh, found. Uh, for instance, uh, there are some run paths for Pool Studio, for example. So uh, 32 bit games uh, on, um, uh, when you were running on, on Steam. They would not have sound, so we found that that issue, and um, and there are also lots of things like Mesa's drivers that are uh, .so files that are not libraries, but they are still modules that they load uh, uh, that are in different paths, uh, and it's a static path that is uh, that we need to, to to know about. So one of the fix here we we, we have patched things to be able to. Uh, to load uh, the files uh, relative to where the library or application was, so to find what where the path was. But this is problematic in the long term because there are always pro new problems that can uh, that can arise, and it's it's be it's better just to fix it uh, for once. Uh, so there was uh, two ways to do it, to to deal with it. There is a uh, multi arch or multi lib. So uh, this is a simplification of what multi arch and multi lib is. It's a bit more complex than that. But uh, in multi arch, you have uh, uh, you have a library uh, a path that uh, contains the name of the ABI 
uh, and then you can compose uh, 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 runtime library paths to make a runtime that contains all the library for the, all the architectures you need. And usually uh, on the SDK part, uh, you will have one compiler for your architecture. You will do the composition at, at the end. In the multi-lib world, it's a bit different. You have uh, li uh, the lib and lib64 directories. And uh, usually you have a compiler that can tack it for both. And you will build for both. You don't have to do this kind of, this kind of thing. But it's usually the thing that will be done. The, we chose to go for multi-arch. The reason is, uh, uh, first, we don't want to build twice. We already built for 32-bit uh, Intel. Um, and uh, and uh, multi-arch was a bit easier for just doing composition at the end. Um, <clears throat> then also we have a, a, a big uh, important thing is that because the multi arch is seldom used, there is not that many apps that need multiple architecture at, at at once. That means that uh, uh, this uh, this should be loaded as extensions, uh, and this is optional downloads that we don't want to download because it's big to download and it's rare that you actually want to download it. Uh, so that means that they will be bind mounted. And uh, because it will be environmented, you will not have, if we did say that uh, user lib was not available on 64-bit, that mm, then we will lose some many files that, that were there originally. And we actually do have 64-bit uh, uh, plugins, for example. It's not sh the shared library, but they are in subdirectories that are m not moved. This we could fix, but we also have things like uh, architecture independent libraries for uh, different uh, uh, scripting languages. So this would have been a problem. So we went for multi-arch, uh, which is uh, like the Debian way, and this is, yes. Cheers. OK, so uh, currently, we've actually just got the GNOME SDK uh, unstable, so the 3.30 uh, runtime is built now on top of 1.8. So that's under GNOME nightly. So you can actually go and download that and run stuff on it. And we're, we're trying to do, test as many apps as we can from Flathub to see if we've broken anything over the, <laughs> over the time. Um, so, so sort of in the future, we, we also want, want to improve things. And we've still got a few things on the roadmap, um, which is one of them is uh, figuring out how to maintain ABI stability, which we actually spoke with Alex about yesterday and got some useful uh, information about that. Um, so we can ensure that Flatpak apps are tested against different releases and not we don't break old, old flat pack apps that are still using the old versions of the runtime and things like that. We'd also like to maybe uh, create bootable VM images, which we actually have um, an example for uh, x86 um, Intel. Uh, but that's just an example at the moment. So we want to improve that for different architectures. Um, so the idea that you could boot, boot the runtime and then test whatever you're testing again, what you're running the, run, uh, the app on, you could test it on the VM and actually interact with the app or something whilst it's running on top of a VM. Uh, and then also try and get the CI to actually test some applications. So currently, we're asking people to test, but we'd like to maybe automate it for a few applications to see if we've broke, broke things. And if, we, if someone does sub submit a merge request, the app would crash, and then maybe we broke something that we didn't realize we'd actually uh, broken. Uh, continuous updates, and then maybe in the future, we could also deploy it as a Docker image or something like that. So that, that would be quite, quite interesting. So, so yeah, so in summary, um, we wanted to update all the packages in 1.6, remove the, the pain points of having different formats and different tools to build it, um, support multi-arch, improve the CI and issue tracking for new contributors and existing contributors, uh, and provide infrastructure for testing future tools. So obviously in the future, when 1.8 becomes stable, we'll want to move to 1.10. So we think with the, with the new CI approach, that might, might be easier to do. Uh, and finally, if you have a Flatpak app or you have any use for a runtime, if you could please go and uh, test your app on top of 1.8 and open a, an issue if you find any bugs or anything like that. But yeah, that would be appreciated. And thank you for listening. Any questions? Yep.
So the, the question was that have we reviewed from 1.6 to 1.8 all the patches and updates? So yeah, we've done that. And we've actually had quite a lot of people. So the next slide is sort of a thank you to people who have contributed. Uh, so a lot of these people have come along and said, hey, you're missing this patch or you know, this version. Uh, you need to update or stuff like that. Yeah, so we've, we've got most of the patches that were actually listed on, I think all of them actually, from, from the original GitHub repo. So yeah. Yes? Um, so, so underneath um, would be well. We actually bootstrap the the SDK with currently with 1.6, which is something that we do need to to change to 1.8 eventually. So it's self self bootstraps. But underneath is is a list of well. If you go to the um, the GitLab, you can actually see in the bootstrap what we actually depend on. So what's compiled to get to the SDK. But uh, Um, so, because it, well, with it being the runtime, it actually runs on the system. It's not actually got uh, a kernel underneath or anything like that. Um, do you, would you know a better answer? Uh, I, I, uh, it troubles to hear your okay. questions. Uh, what what what's systems what's can the runtime run on? So what, what system it can run on? Uh, this is the. Yes, this is an image uh, that uh, that doesn't have a kernel, so it's not. Uh, well, there we have some tests for that for Intel, but it's it's uh, mostly uh, for using flat uh, flat pack for the moment. So you just have, or you could you use for Docker or something like that. It's mostly for container kind of uh, system. Use cases, yeah. Yes, so you already have a kernel running, and you just uh, just have a, a new route uh, for uh, for you for running some applications. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's targeting Linux, but there is not the kernel is not there. But we still uh, it's still <laughs> the Linux API that we use there. No, no. We no. would we would have to to compile the C library for uh, for it. But uh, I mean, this is something we could work on at some point. But uh, we, we need to uh, also consider what uh, how we would use it uh, uh, because. Flat we would use something else than Flatpak. There are some container things that we can use there. Any other questions? No? <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening.